Rule of Rose is a complicated game. The story doesn't play out in chronological order. Events don't always take place in the locations they're portrayed to. But it's not a pointlessly complicated or convoluted game. There is a good reason for why everything seems so fractured. Before we go further and I put this game in chronological order, this video, needless to say, will contain full story spoilers. Also, given how much of the game is open to interpretation, there are plenty of valid theories for how this game works than the one I am about to present. After playing through the game a few times and for a few years, and reading through all the in-game journals, this is how I believe everything works. With that, let's get into it. The game begins by showing us the latest point in the timeline. This is our main character Jennifer, as a young adult. As she rests on a public bench, the sound of children playing and a dog barking triggers a dormant memory in her fractured psyche. From here, Jennifer takes a bus to the orphanage she grew up in, in an attempt to better recall what it is she had forgotten. While on the bus, she meets a young boy named Joshua, who presents her with a story. Joshua runs away almost immediately after. There's something we need to note here, however. While adult Jennifer is taking this bus to the orphanage, not everything is as it seems. None of this is actually happening. The bus was a metaphor similar to the ferryman, who ferries the souls of the dead to the afterlife. Of course, Jennifer is not dead, so this kind of ferryman is simply taking her to a place in her memory she had long forgotten. Joshua and the story that he presented to Jennifer don't actually exist here either. They are nothing more than a creation of Jennifer's subconscious, designed to help push Jennifer in the right direction. A direction that will help her better remember the past she left behind, and the dead whom she once made promises to. Here we enter a dreamlike, warped world, exploring the memories of a PTSD-stricken child. This game often takes place in two different locations, the orphanage and surrounding area, and an airship. The earliest in-game documents point towards a small sort of union of these two locations, where a group of orphans were invited to the ribbon-cutting ceremony for Britain's largest ever airship. This was in April. The next earliest point in the timeline comes in June, from the diaries of a man named Gregory. Gregory is a poor farmer who lives just outside of the orphanage with his son Joshua. His journal chronicles how Joshua has been getting sick. The further into the journal we read, the sicker and more hopeless Joshua's life becomes. Gregory tries his best, as the good man that he is, to give Joshua some joy and happiness in life by reading him stories from storybooks that he makes himself. But Joshua's condition progressively worsens. While Gregory and Joshua are fighting their battles at home, Jennifer, at her youngest point in the story, is boarding the airship the orphans attended the ceremony for. Jennifer is not an orphan at this point in the story, as she boards the airship with her rather upper-class family and is using it for leisurely travel. The trip she's on does not go according to plan, however. Through newspapers recovered in-game, we discover the airship towards the end of June had gone completely missing. During this time, Joshua's illness reaches its critical peak, and Gregory stops writing in his diary. We can safely assume here that Joshua had died. This is evidenced later, of course, by Joshua's absence, Gregory's depression, and the homemade grave behind his house. Newspapers would later report that the airship was found close to the orphanage, and that no survivors were recovered. However, we learn this isn't quite the case. As Gregory was coping with the death of his son, he saw the wreckage of the airship and ran to it. When he arrived, among the wreckage he found one survivor, Jennifer. This is where Jennifer's life started to take a turn for the worst, as she is now the sole survivor of a tragedy that many, including her parents, died in. But her hell on earth is just beginning. Gregory, in his depression, sees his discovery of Jennifer as a way to move forward with his life. He develops a very, very unhealthy coping mechanism. Gregory abducts Jennifer and forces her to live in his home. He calls Jennifer by the name Joshua and makes her wear his son's clothing. He reads Jennifer's stories every night in a drunken and depressed stupor. But his denial allows him to keep going with his life despite his strong desire to turn towards suicide. Roughly six months pass like this, as Jennifer is forced to fill a role she should have never been placed into. November comes around, when at the window of Jennifer's basement bedroom, a girl appears. This girl came from the Rose Orphanage, and her name is Wendy. Jennifer introduces herself to Wendy as Joshua, 
and the two strike up conversation. For quite a while, they make their secret meetings a regular thing. They grow an immense fondness for each other, and Jennifer discloses all of her secrets to Wendy. Wendy, soon after, breaks Jennifer free from her captivity and takes her to live at the Rose Orphanage. Her and Wendy continue to solidify their relationship and make a promise of everlasting love to one another. To signify their love and the promise they made to one another, they make a trade. Jennifer gives to Wendy the one possession she has, a teddy bear she found in Joshua's wardrobe, dressed with the same green ribbon Gregory's son Joshua was prone to wearing. The two girls give the bear the fitting name, Joshua. Time passes and things are good for a while, but Jennifer could never guess how much damage will come from giving Wendy the Joshua bear. After some more time passes, Jennifer seems to make a new friend, in the form of a seemingly abandoned stray dog. Jennifer takes the dog in and names him Brown. Jennifer raises the dog well and keeps him very close by. This, over time, makes Wendy jealous. The time Jennifer spends with Wendy gradually decreases as the time she spends with Brown goes up. In her jealousy, Wendy forms a club among the orphans called the Aristocrat Club. Though she never outright states it, the purpose of this club is to attack, bully, and exclude Jennifer from the fun and games at the orphanage. The ultimate end goal, of course, being to get rid of Jennifer's dog so Wendy and Jennifer can be together again. Wendy forces the orphans to take part in her games and establishes a hierarchy among the children, where the strong will abuse and control the weak. Children who perform poorly in her games are threatened with horrific punishments and fear of death. No matter how much pressure Wendy put on Jennifer, Jennifer would not crack, choosing instead to turn on the people who call themselves her friend rather than reward or comply with their wicked ways. Wendy, not willing to accept defeat, takes drastic measures. Wendy disappears for a short while, and when she returns, a horrid truth is revealed. Wendy, using everything she knows about Gregory, abuses his mental state. Pretending to be his son, Wendy trains Gregory to behave as a rabid stray dog. Her intent? to bring Gregory to the orphanage and attack and frighten Jennifer. Wendy's last-ditch effort, however, does not quite go according to her plan, as Gregory unleashes himself in a boundless manner upon the orphans, mercilessly slaying one after the other, until none remain besides Jennifer. Jennifer, knowing Gregory's struggle with suicidal thoughts, places a gun into Gregory's hands. The feeling of the gun in his hands brings a quieting and sobering familiarity to light, and Gregory turns the gun on himself, leaving Jennifer once again the single sole survivor of a mass tragedy. We can look at the events that transpired here and point the finger at Wendy for being an all-around bad person and abusing those who suffered tragedies, but Wendy isn't bad just for the sake of it, as there's an underlying subplot in this game that may explain why these orphans are so willing to partake in these messed up games. This subplot comes in the form of the orphanage's headmaster, Mr. Hoffman. Hoffman can be seen from time to time being more hands-on with some of the young girls at the orphanage than is really acceptable. At different points of the story, you find him locking himself in rooms with some of the girls that ought not be locked. In one chapter, you see Hoffman stroking somebody in a bed quite aggressively. When you access that room later, you find the young girl Clara in the bed. This bed as well, though you find it on the airship, is the same bed you find in Hoffman's bedroom in the orphanage, leading to the conclusion that Jennifer seen Hoffman abusing Clara in his bedroom. Through unused audio recoverable from the game's disc, we can find that these themes of molestation and hebophilia were intended to go much further than they did in the released game. While ultimately this remains a theory, it is one I believe the game strongly supports. This would also explain why Hoffman is viewed in Jennifer's memory as one of the bosses and twisted figures she must defeat. The orphans don't abuse one another and act in such vile ways simply because they are bad people, but because they are also abused and damaged people. Damaged and abused by the ones meant to take care of them. These events damaged Jennifer on a deeply psychological level. Experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder and denial, Jennifer locks away the memories, unable to comprehend them at her current level of maturity. Rule of Rose, in its near entirety, is nothing more than a PTSD-stricken young adult recalling their tragic past. In many ways, it is a social statement and character study on the psychologically damaged. Rule of Rose tells a daring story, whose scope is nearly entirely realized, 
But the sensibilities of the public and a need to make sales without mass controversy did unfortunately limit it, causing some statements to end up on the cutting room floor. Despite the limitations though, I do, in all actuality, feel this is among one of the greatest stories ever told in the genre, and certainly is one of the most important. Hey, where are it's my shame when I call your name? So please don't set me free. I'm as heavy as can be. I will do you harm. I will break my 